of our friends and loved ones that are watching us around the world. Come on, let's make some noise for our friends. We thank you, we celebrate you. You know, before I jump into the word, I wanna encourage everybody. You know, I started a new series on Wednesdays, which is our midweek service. We've titled The Conflict, right? And we're talking about the promises of God and the realities of life. If you were not here on Wednesday, let me tell you, God is really stretching us, and I want to challenge everybody to come out and be a part of that. And I also want to challenge our friends that are close in the surrounding cities to not miss out on what God is doing during the midweek service. Amen? Amen. 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 So good. Welcome to week four of this series that we have titled, Same God, New Me. That's right, God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. But as we start off the year, we've, we've determined that, that he's unchanging, but there's definitely some areas in our life that need to change. Can I get a good amen? amen. Now, this is, not, this is not for you to feel guilty. I said in our lives, all of us, myself included, Right? We, I have some goals this year. I believe that God is not done with me. I believe that there's still some areas in my life that God wants to improve. Amen? So we've been talking about that today. Today I want to take you and close up this series. And I want to speak on the theme, the blessing of togetherness. The blessing of togetherness. You know, I was studying uh, several years ago about what we did right now. And, and for those of you that are, that are watching us, this is a, a Sunday that we've declared a heart for the house. That's right. And we're bringing to the Lord our first fruit offering. And when you study Jewish tradition, they did this as a family. In other words, they did it together. And I, I, believe, that, I believe that in the kingdom, uh, we're supposed to do things together. Like, like countries avoid wars because they learn how to work together. Marriages that are triumphant are triumphant because they work together. Now, if you came in fighting with your spouse, don't look at them. Just look at me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Children and parents get along when they stop fighting with you and determine, hey, guys, we're on the same team. Like, we're in this together organizations and I can give you a bunch of different exi uh, uh, examples but but togetherness brings about great joy and great excitement so I want to speak about that today over the next several minutes but I want to invite the Holy Spirit to, to come into this moment right now and to to help us bring this to life amen and that that it would fall on 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 good ears amen and that we would be good good recipients of it let's pray father we thank you you're so good so faithful i pray god that you would speak to everyone that is here and those that are watching around the world we thank you for your faithfulness for all that you've done and all that you will do and we pray this in the matchless name of jesus christ and everybody said amen, amen. you may be seated i want to challenge you as i always do to open up your rwc church app so that we can grow somebody say together <laughs> that's right so that we can grow together the great entrepreneur known to all of us henry ford he said this he says uh, coming together is the beginning staying together is progress but working together is success even when you study the early church the New Testament church in the first century, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14, this is not in your notes, but look at what he says about the church. He says, for the body is not one member, but many. In other words, it's, it's not just one, not just one, but many. That's why we're called the body of Christ, amen? That's why, so, so it's important for us to understand that the centralized theme the centralized theme of the Word of God is centered around family. It's centered around a group of people. It's centered around the effectiveness of together. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. I want to start off here today. It is a verse that we know, uh, we declare quite often. Um, if you've been around church 
for more than a month, you've probably heard Jeremiah 29, 11. The Bible says this. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Somebody say amen. amen. Look at what his plans are. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Verse 12. Then, somebody say then. Then, then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Amen. I wanted to start off here to remind you that, that regardless of what you're going through, God has a plan for your life. Even as we get ready to declare as a family together, I think it's important for us to understand that God is already faithful. Like he's not going to be faithful. He's already faithful. Like God has already opened up a way for you and has already created miracles. Maybe you can't see them, but God is already a miracle worker. God has already answered prayers on your behalf. I know you're, you're waiting on future prayers, but God has already been there for us. So now, now this is what I love about, about this scripture is that, that God is declaring this and he's, he's trying to get the people to get excited and remind him, remind them about his divine nature. That the plans that he has for them are plans of good and not of evil to prosper them. But, but then verse 12 says, then. See, then, from, from verse 11 to verse 12 and, and this, this amazing dichotomy and difference, there was a 70 year 70 year gap from the time that God declared this to the time that they would see. Then, then you will come on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. So he was speaking to them about something that they were pres presently not living. Presently maybe not seen. And I think some of us, we lose sight of, of, of God and how good he's been because while we wait, we get frustrated. And while we wait, we get anxious. And while we wait, we get annoyed. But I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you that as God spoke to them and reminded them, hey, guys, I want you to know I'm not done with you. You might have to wait a little bit, but I'm not done with you. So as you get ready to declare the goodness of God over your family and over your finances and over your marriage and over your neighborhood and over your city, it may not look good today. It might not even look good in March or April or May or June, but I dare you to believe that God is still in the business of giving you a hope and a future. Can I get a good amen? The only principle that I want to share with you today is this one. And that is that togetherness produces legacy. Together produces legacy. I believe that Christianity is not an independent study, but it's actually a group project. And, and I know that, that for, for some of us, that's a little bit hard because we are, we are spiritually only children. We're only child. We got the only child syndrome, and we want to do things on our own and, and exist on our own. But that's not God's best for your life. You see, God would not want you to go through life by yourself. God understands the principle and the power of togetherness. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 to 25, look at what the Bible tells us. Let us hold, hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing but encouraging one another encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching I want to release certain truths to you for those of you that are here and challenge you you see, together I learn, I've learned that together is God's plan. I've learned that together isn't always easy. <laughs> I remember uh, before we, 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 we were a church plant in, in 2009, before 2009, 2008 was a, a year preparation. 
And part of the things, part of the things that we did, right, was uh, our core team, we went out uh, together to Mexico to minister. Like this was kind of a, a missions trip, if you will. Uh, it, was, it was myself and, 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 our, and, our, and, our, and our first core team. It was our, our worship team came out. Like without us knowing, uh, this was us being together for the first time. And boy, can I tell you, together was rough. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't know each other. We didn't know each other uh, intimately. We knew of each other. Uh, but we were getting ready to launch a church together. Right, and, and, and we decided, you know, my pastor had told me, Eli, I need you in Mexico. Um, can you bring anybody along? I said, I got you. And we brought 12 people along. It was, a, it was me and 12, and we went off. We went off. Can I tell you? Everybody got sick. I almost lost Manny. <laughs> True story. True story. True story. The, the day before we flew back, Manny decided that he would, that he would have a little dessert by the, by the, by the coast. He still doesn't know what he ate. <laughs> Let me tell you something. It almost ate him. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Not only that, but there was conflict because it was, it was a big group of people staying, staying in the same house, primarily. The bulk of us stayed in the same house. We had about seven people sleeping in one bedroom. <laughs> the house where we were staying in the woman, I don't know if she's watching us, but she couldn't cook to save her life. <laughs> Jesus is right. <laughs> Jesus is right. One morning, I, 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 she says, do you guys love, love coffee? And I said, do we love coffee? <laughs> we adore coffee. We love coffee. So she decided out of the goodness of her heart, she would wake up in the morning and make us all coffee. When we looked at that coffee pot, it wasn't black, y'all. It was gray. That's right. So we dumped it behind her back, made some more coffee. And every morning we would wake up before she did and tell her, we already made the coffee. Thank you very much. So there's blessing in together. There was, I remember there was arguments. I even argued with my pastor during that trip. That's right. Because together, although it's God's plan, but together isn't always easy. Matter of fact, I would dare say that together can be messy. <laughs> together takes, listen, together takes a choice. To believe that God can change your marriage. Together, that's a choice. Change the course of your business that's a choice change the course of your health that's a choice so I've learned in my life that that it's it's messy it's a choice but together together I've learned takes work that's right I've often told you this that that marriage is spelled w-o-r-k because you thought you thought that, that your marriage would be defined and would always be as beautiful as your honeymoon and your marriage ceremony was. But then you woke up first day after your honeymoon. Hello, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Together takes work. And, and I would say, I would even go further along, and I would say that, it, that together, a lot of times, it's inconvenient. Because you know you, but you don't know the person next to you. You know the way that you interpret challenges and affliction and, and, and attacks, but, but you don't know how that person interprets it and how they go about it. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you guys about togetherness because I understand that this year God is getting ready to do something in this house. I'm going to say that again. God is getting ready to do something in this house. We've never had all the challenges that we have in 2020 as a nation, as believers, and even as a local ministry. And yet I have never been filled with more peace than I feel right now. Like I feel like I'm on cruise control because I know who's driving. Can I get an amen today? So... 
as inconvenient as it is, it is God's plan for your life. Now, you may say, Pastor, why, why it's so inconvenient? <laughs> because our greatest hurts have come by way of people. And here we are talking about being together. And, and uh, there is no, there's no way for you to be together than for you to be with someone, right? And as, as y'all already know, this week was the launch of small groups. Yeah. And there is an excitement in the air, and myself included. Man, I was so pumped. I left my small group Tuesday night, and I just wanted to just, I was so happy. I was so excited. I was so full of life, so energized. I was so pumped. I got to my house. I couldn't stop talking. <laughs> yeah. That's what happens. There's, there's beauty, but, it, but it's, it's become inconvenient because your greatest hurt and my greatest hurt has never been caused by a robot. It's never been caused by my car. It's never been caused by possessions. It's been caused by people. The betrayal of folks. People that said they would be there, but they're not there. People that said that you could count on them, but they're far. They're far from being active in your life. And yet, here we are on the Heart for the House Sunday, and you thought you were going to hear something different, but the word that God has for us is that you ought to reconsider doing your life by yourself and instead embrace all that God wants to do in your life through the blessing and through the great idea that is his called togetherness. Together. The average teenager has about 300 Instagram followers, Instagram friends, and when they're asked how many friends you actually have, uh, the great majority of them said just one, just one, just one, just one that's actually there for me, just one that goes beyond the likes of my pictures, just one that can see behind the superficialness of a filter and realize that I am hurting. And realize that I am broken. And I wonder how many of us have gone through life. And here we are in our 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s. And you look back at your life and you realize that you've been doing it by yourself. And I know that we have, we have our defenses extremely high. And, and I know that it's a, it's, a, it's a good and cool thing maybe for you to say that uh, I don't trust anyone. And I'd rather be by myself than have the wrong company. And I, and I get you. I get you. But I promise you that if you just let the word of God do what it promises to do. And you let it heal your heart and heal your mind and begin to heal your, your past life. God will do something supernatural. And he's going to send someone to your life that's going to add value that's going to bless you come on church together i think about men in the bible that their life was was greatly impacted by this amazing principle of together and for me no one is more of an example of this than king david because King David was a man after God's own heart. We know that. The Bible says that more than one time. But we know that King David brought the, the giant, right, uh, Goliath down, right? But we know that he was a great king who knew how to dance so much so that his clothes would fall off. David knew how to party, y'all. Yeah. We, we know all that about King David, but, 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 but can I tell you something? That David's life would have never been as powerful, as impactful, as life changing to present and future generations for us to be talking to him in the corner of the world called Springfield, Massachusetts, had it not been for this concept of together. The Bible says that God sends Samuel to the house of Jesse, David's father, to anoint the next king of Israel. And David is son number eight. And, and Jesse prepared the family, prepared the banquet because the prophet was coming to his house. And Samuel walks inside the house of Jesse and there's seven men, uh, but David was not invited to the party. David was not together with them because he was, he was ostracized because he was overlooked. Have you ever been overlooked in your life? Hello, somebody. Have you ever been undervalued? Thus was the story of David. But Samuel steps in. 
to be a father to a young man that never had a father, although his father was present. Now, if, you've, if, you've, if your relationship with your dad has been one that was rough because dad was present, but he was really absent. Like, like dad, dad was there every day. Like he was, he was sleeping in the same roof, but he was emotionally absent. Never tactful with you. And you grew up your entire life in need of this person that, that you had a picture of, but there was an emotional void. There was emptiness within your heart. Thus was the story of David. A man with a father that was fatherless and Samuel steps in to fill the gap and, and I believe that God wants to fill the gap in your life. Samuel steps in to be a father to David and the Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 16 verse 12 and 13 I feel the preaching anointing coming. I'm going to try to contain myself. <laughs> but 1 Samuel chapter 16 verse 12 and 13 look at what the Bible says. Then the Lord said rise up and anoint him this is the one so samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers and from that day on the spirit of the lord came powerfully upon david david couldn't anoint himself david couldn't promote himself david could not assume a position yet he needed someone to push him to his prophetic destiny you will never get where god wants to take you unless you allow someone to pass you someone to correct you someone to push you someone Someone to instruct you someone come on I, we need togetherness we need people to love us with the truth we need people to challenge us with heavenly messages we need people that see the greatness in us beyond the righteousness beyond the rough past that we've had beyond the cattiness we need someone that will look past all that stuff and still love you enough to tell you God's not done with you God is about to start something new in your life so so what does together produce let me give you two things that together produces number one we produce the best in each other when we're together as is the story of Samuel and David Samuel calls out the best in David the very best the principle of relationship is not just addition but I need you to hear this. It's also subtraction. Some of us are together, but we're together with the wrong folk. Like, like you are unequally yoked in every sense of the word. I'm not talking about marriage. I'm talking about being unequally yoked with your friends. Unequally yoked with the people that speak into your life. Unequally yoked with mentors. Unequally yoked with your confidants. So, so here we see the story of a man called David who knew that Saul could not be what he needed him to be. So David had the wherewithal and the understanding to know I got to keep Saul at a distance. And yet I have to embrace Samuel. We've got to have a stiff arm for the Sauls and an open arm for the Samuels. Some of us have lived our whole life and we've been accepting of the wrong thing and rejecting the right thing. The very thing you need is the thing you run from. The very thing you need. Now, now, now I could have called this message an inconvenient truth. So here is David, understanding that together was a blessing, but he had to also reject the togethers that could bring him down. Proverbs 27 verse 17, the Bible tells us, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. In life, in life, you will have four types of people, four types of people. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run through this real quick. Number one, you have takers. And takers are not necessarily bad for you, but you got to have a well. You've got to have a reserve. Because if all you have around you is takers, but your well is dry, 
you're going to get frustrated. And you're going to close the door at friendships. And it was never their fault. It was your inability to make sure that you replenish your well. So you will have takers. And then you will also have givers. These are people that not only take from you, but bless you. Not only take counsel from you, but that you can give counsel to them. And they can counsel you. Number three, you will have people, I call it, you will have, number three, you will have people that you can work out with. <laughs> what do you mean by that? You spot me, I spot you. Hello. I watch your blind spots and you watch my blind spots. If you ever see me a little fugazi or froggy, you let me know. And if I ever see you a little fugazi or froggy, you better believe it that I'm going to let you know. <laughs> so, so you need people to work out with. And lastly, number four, you will have people in your life that are toxic. And those are the people you got to give the stiff arm to. Hello, somebody. And number two, what does together produce? When we're together, we call out the truth to each other. You know, we, we grew up in a time, remember the campaign, real friends don't let friends drive. Drive drunk. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, well I changed it. <laughs> real friends uh, uh, don't let friends drive through life aimlessly. You better believe that if you're in my life and I'm in your life, I can't afford to just see you going around in circles, getting nowhere fast. No dreams, no goals, no order. Like, like I, I'm not, I'm not going to judge you. I'm going to love you. And I'm going to love you with the truth. Now, it might change the way you see me, but I'm all right with that. I need you to hear this in your life today. As we get ready to do life together and declare together and, and raise up a family together, some of us have to apply this to our family. You're in five different directions. You're looking out for your best interests. And in the meantime, your children are but one step away from hell. And there you go with yourself. God has called us to do this together. 2 Samuel 12, 7. Do you remember when Nathan shows up and calls out the truth of David? And tells David, hey, David, you know that, that vision I told you about and that dream I told you about and that beautiful story I told you about? David, you are the man in the story. Yeah, David, you are a murderer. David, you have blood in your hands. I love that. David was a man after God's own heart. But there was some stuff. It was the it was same God, but God wanted to do a new hymn. Hello, somebody. And God used Nathan, again, togetherness. God uses togetherness to remind David, David, you're that man. Don't look, don't look to cast judgment on someone else. You're the man that has done that. That's what togetherness does. We call out the truth in each other. I want to finish here, Proverbs 27, verse 5 and 6. The Bible says that an open rebuke is better than hidden love. And wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. I read a quote this week that I want to share with you, and with this I'm done. To quote by Corey Ten Boom, and he said, Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to an unknown God. An unknown future to a known God. And as we get ready to declare to the Lord and today I want to challenge you to trust God we're going to do it together but I want to challenge you to do this year do it together this year uh, you've been doing life by yourself we could be in a congregation in an or it doesn't matter we've gone through life by ourselves. that is not God's best God wants you to do it together come on look at your neighbor and tell him God wants us to do it together he wants us he wants us to do it together he says Come on, with that said, I want you to stand up on your feet. I want you to stand up on your feet. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you. Lord, you're so good. You're so faithful. 
I want you to close your eyes where you are. I want you to bow your heads. And for those of you that are listening around the world, I want to, you may be here today and you may be saying, Pastor, I'm, what do I do? How, how, how possibly can I do it together when I'm by myself? How do I do it? Can I tell you that, that none of us start off by ourselves? Jesus paid the ultimate price on the cross of Calvary. He extended his arms, as the psalmist says, from the east to the west. From as far as the east is to the west, so is the love of God for us. Now you may be going through loneliness, but you don't have to be lonely. You may be going through isolation, but you don't have to do life by yourself. Jesus loves you and wants to save you. So if you're in this room, you're in this room and you don't know him. You've been going through life by yourself. I want to give you an opportunity to take Jesus with you. Right where you are, if you know you need Jesus. At the count of three, I want you to lift up your right hand. One, two, three. Re real quick, lift it up. God bless you. 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 Praise God. Come on, church. Come on, let's all lift up our hands with them. And let us all repeat this simple prayer. Say, Heavenly Father, I know that I've done some wrongs. But I also know that you died on the cross for all of my failures. So today... I boldly confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he died for me. And on the third day, he resurrected to give me life. So today, I choose life. Today, I choose Christ. Amen and amen. Hi guys, thank you for tuning in. If this message has blessed you, please don't forget to subscribe. You can share the message with your friends and loved ones. But also, if you've been touched by the ministry, I want to encourage you to partner up with us. You can follow the link below so that together we can continue to share the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. Thank you so much.